Thank you. Um, and I will start sharing my screen now. Okay, first of all, I'd like to um, thank the committee for allowing me to talk today and thank you for all the speakers as well. It's quite interesting to see common themes across different countries. We're talking about that um, collaboration with police forces, forensic scientists. We in the UK also share that difficulty that there is that disconnect. So it's quite interesting. And we're actually, you know, some of the topics that we discussed in the previous talk, I will also bring into this presentation. So I thank you so much for the previous speakers because actually it, it, it all combines into one. And I think everyone contributes to the bigger cause that we know to improve the criminal justice system, whether you're in, in India or whether you're in the UK, it's regardless, we still face those issues uh, around the criminal justice system. So as I lovely introduced, my name is Dr. Jonathan Brooks. I am a research fellow at King's College uh, University in London. Um, I'm also biochemical lead for the working group for taphonomic advancement um, and also a research fellow at the University of Leicester and also Saxon University. And today we're going to be exploring very quickly what is forensic taphonomy because it's an emerging field. Um, it comes from uh, a range of subjects um, and originally came from a field of uh, paleontology and how we develop that such a vast subject to then uh, implement that into the field of forensic science that we all have a, a particular interest in. I do, as a duty as a forensic practitioner, have to make you aware that you will be seeing graphic images of um, cadaver remains. Um, there will be some um, pictures of some operational um, cases that I've dealt with. So just make sure um, that there are sensitive nature and you need to be just aware of that if that's something that isn't of interest to you. So what is taphonomy? So the word taphonomy actually derives from uh, two Greek words, uh, taphos meaning burial and nomos meaning law. And so it's basically the, the, the law of burial. So what actually happens? What is the process? How is it broken down? What are the fundamental mechanisms involved in burials and this field derives from paleontology um, and one of the first um, definitions of what taphonomy was was based around that transition of organic matter uh, in situ from the biosphere which is known as the, the kind of um, the very kind of surface of, of, um, uh, of land um, to the lithosphere which is mainly atmospheric we then, as forensic scientists, start to uh, adapt this terminology to the criminal justice system. And where we apply this, and it's another understanding the process of human decay. And as a part of that, we look at short term periods decomposition. Paleontology looks at thousands of years of um, mechanisms of how that preservation is uh, occurring. Whereas, as forensic scientists, we're more interested in the short term, how exactly does a body decompose in a specific time frame? And there is, of, all, of course, a variability of decay, um, whether you are in a different country, different temperatures, different humidities. However, I think much of the research is focused on what is the difference and what potentially we're missing is the uniformity. And we're going to be touching that on in this presentation. And of course, I've mentioned about the multidisciplinary. Much of the research has focused on individual aspects of um, taphonomy. So focusing on the entomology of how um, insects are attracted to human decomposition. Um, anthropology, what is the skeletal aspects um, post um, decay? Um, but what we're taking now is more of a multidisciplinary approach. So combining all these expertise to give a grounded, a more um, substantial approach to um, understanding how humans decompose and in turn helping our better understanding of research and better time since death estimation. So in essence, we're looking at a process. So if you're unaware of the taphonomy subject, um, we have these five 
specific stages that we generally see in any aspect of decomposition. They are fresh, bloated, active decay, advanced decay, and skeletonization. And obviously there are a series of reactions and um, qualitative observations that you do see as part of that process. For example, in the fresh, you see what we refer as rigor mortis. And this is the, the restriction uh, and the constriction of muscles um, of, of cadavers um, as a result of restricted calcium within the actual muscle itself. And there are various degrees of um, qualitative observations that you do observe throughout the decomposition process. But we're not going to concentrate on that today. We're going to be more talking about how we're approaching this multidisciplinary approach. I've obviously put it there so you can kind of look up or research any of the, the different um, observations you see. Here are some more post-mortem changes um, that are more qualitative, so you're able to see. And there's been research to an attempt to kind of look at whether you can correlate the changes that you see to an actual time figure. So you can use these qualitative aspects, observations, to determine when um, uh, a, an estimation of death. Um, but of, of, of course, these observations are variable depending on the, the actual environment that the, the specimen is in. Now, much of what I'm going to be talking about today is biochemical taphonomy. And we'll come on to what the actual meaning of that is. But you have two main processes when we talk about biochemical taphonomy. The first one being autolysis, which is the self-destruction and degradation of soft tissue by enzymatic processes. And much of that is around that um, uptake of oxygen in the initial process. So um, from the onset of death, you have um, a large concentration of oxygen and that is utilized by this process. But as we start to progress, that concentration of oxygen decreases and we start to go in from a process of an uh, aerobic to anaerobic decomposition. And this is where we go on to the second process, which is your putrefaction. And this is the, the transition, as it were, from autolytic um, processes to the anaerobic. And we are starting to look at the different types of bacteria that are associated with each of those. So we're looking at some of the bacteria those, um, Clostridium, uh, Staphylococcus, um, and the enterobacterias. So um, looking at correlating that to see what exactly that transition looks like to determine the biochemical degradation. So like I said, multiple discipline approaches. So we talk about um, the different fields. So if we were to look at, and then start, uh, let's have a look. Actually, no, I'm going to choose. So if I was just a, a typical crime scene manager or crime scene corner, the different aspects of looking at uh, um, taphonomic remains. So you've obviously got uh, botanical aspects, you know, what are the interaction of that, the biochemical transition from these specimens into this vegetation. Um, you're looking at potentially, if you're a forensic biologist, okay, can we take profiles from this um, for identification? You're looking at what aspect is this? Obviously, you have um, large preservation of the skin tissue there. Um, anthropological, looking at, okay, is this something from weathering? Is this something part of decomposition process? Or is this inflicted um, pre-death um, in terms of uh, suspicious activity? Looking at potentially the, what we call cadaveric island, so the area around the body. As the body decomposes, much of the biochemical content transitions into the area, so it was known as a CDI, um, and Carter et al. Um, and Cape Parole in Hawaii has done a significant amount of research around looking at the physotonic uh, toxic aspects um, around the biochemical profile of that soil. So in essence, from after all my scribblings on the screen, you can see that you start to add up to a quite a multidisciplinary approach. And I've not even considered maybe we still have some insect activity. Um, we maybe have some pollen potentially integrated into this actual tissue. So all this information is vital to actually understand not only cause of death, but also um, the time since death, if that's something that we really need to understand. And um, 
when we're talking about transient death, I think we've much uh, concentrated on it being a validated technique and this is where we need to have accurate results. And I completely agree, but it's a new emerging field. We need to start utilizing it for intelligence-based operations and guiding you in the way of um, giving you more information around particular cases that are complex. So how can it be useful? As I just explained, we need to start making people aware about what is um, the potential from something that you've just seen. What evidence, what intelligence can that give a practitioner in uh, undertaking an investigation? So forensic taphonomy, the biochemical aspects, this is what I always teach my students and always um, try and hit home in their research projects is that sometimes um, a quote from the Lion King, if you've ever seen it, to find it, you must look beyond what you see. And when I speak to most of the crime scene managers and crime scene coordinators in the UK, much of their understanding is that just because it's a gas and they can't see it, they automatically think that it's it's void and it doesn't provide any different form of intelligence. And that's wrong. It can really guide you. It's the biochemistry of how a body decomposes. So that's why I mean by look beyond what you can see. And when we're talking about biochemistry, we think about the, the fundamentals of what actually happens in decomposition. So we're talking about um, humans and how we have the same organs and tissue types. Um, obviously excluding medical intervention and we all have the same mechanisms, we still have the phys physiological responses um, and we're all very similar um, in terms of the communities and therefore when we're talking about biochemistry we're of course we're talking about a human decomposing um, and the same organs decomposing, the same proteins, the same carbohydrates. So it bewilders me to think that there is no uniformity between human decomposition. Yes, we focus on what the difference is, but what, I, what is the uniformity? What can we utilize for the criminal justice system? And so, again, so this is um, kind of advancing on what I've kind of gone on here, and this is a picture from um, the Arista facility in the Netherlands. Um, of course, a body will decompose differently, and that will obviously differ, depends on the extremities of the environment. And obviously, we will have biochemistry degradation from microbial species, but we will still have that macromolecular degradation. And so there needs to be some uniformity. And of course, we are such in early stages that we, we do need to optimize that, but we're in early stages. So a lovely example, and I, I can imagine you didn't even if, uh, anticipate this picture ever coming onto a slide like mine. Um, but this looks at um, degradation of a banana in different environments. So you can see on this one, um, over here, this is on top of the fridge, um, this is in the oven, and you can see, yes, there's different patterns, absolutely. However, the uniformity across all of the bananas is that there is a discoloration of the brown pigment. And that's a result of um, the uh, ethanol, um, complex within the atmosphere causing that and influencing how what degree is that brown pigment um, present on that banana. But uniformity. And there's been a lot of research around um, two specific compounds called cadaverine and putrescine, um, and they've been presumed to be the two compounds of great interest around the, the center of decomposition. Um, and to date in the VOC profile, it's not been identified. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's not there. It just simply suggests that the analytical instruments that we are utilizing aren't specific for those, um, compound, um, for those compounds. So we've started utilizing Heisel probes um, on the Arista facility to determine whether we can um, passively absorb onto um, a polydimethylsiloxane um, uh, layer, um, very similar to the SPME um, and the coatings that we, the, comp, the talk that we just had um, before the last one, um, and seeing whether that's something that is, because of the increased uh, exposure time above a cadaver, 
the potential that we might see these compounds. So we're starting to advance and start to like utilizing a greater range of analytical tools. So now I'm going to go into a little bit of the research. Um, much of the research um, in the UK is human. Um, is there any questions so far? Okay. Um, much of the research um, in the UK is focused on humans. We're restricted down to the human tissue act of 2004. And we are, have to use DEFRA restrictions. Um, and we have multiple animal uh, analog facilities. So we use pig. Um, and the biggest one in Europe um, is traitors at the University of Central Lancaster, and they do some great research there. Um, but much of it is qualitative. So what does the changes look like? Where can you go from here? And it's not quantitative. What is it that we can put values to to give a more definite answer? And the problem is, as you will all well know, is that each university has its specialisms. And so the difficulty is getting everyone around the table to discuss what the results mean. So this is the research. These are two cadaver dogs that are trained on land and to detect um, remains underwater. And as part of my PhD, I worked with Stanza and um, I think Harley. Um, and they, um, I was looking at um, analyzing the profiles of their training aids to establish what the uniformity across all those samples were to see if we can utilize chemical uh, training aids to make it more accurate and more effective for them. A uh, recent project um, of a master's student at King's College is utilizing sorbent tubes. So we discussed in the previous talk about um, the PDMS and the um, micro extraction material. So we use that, absorb all the human decomposition and um, gaseous volatiles. We analyze it and we're able to create as a result of splitting that um, material, one into the instrument and one onto a training aid. So we have certified training aids for cadaver dogs. It's very um, novel uh, and we're testing this out um, uh, come December on more human decomposition rather than pig decomposition. So far we've had success, um, but I will keep all those that are interested updated. This was uh, my PhD data um, that is nearly published. Um, it's a series of four papers looking at um, laboratory controlled decomposition and how we can control the environment and ensure that we see uniformity um, and looking at decomposition. So you can see this one here is the um, aerobic. If I can help. And then this one, Is the anaerobic. So these here. And yes, visually, you can see that you have perforation of the abdomen region there. There is no perforation in this one here. Um, and um, apologies. So this, I don't know what this presentation has done here. So this is, this is the anaerobic day zero. And that's the um, anaerobic day 30. And this is the aerobic aerobic day zero. And this is the aerobic day 30. So you can see between this one, this is the aerobic day zero, and this is the aerobic day 30. Yes, oxygen has a significant impact on the qualitative aspect of post-mortem changes. But if we talk about the anaerobic, there is significant insignificant changes to the actual um, observation or qualitative data that you get. However, you draw a uniformity in the volatiles between the different um, regions and two uh, environments. This is the actual um, quantitative data. So this is um, the multi-dimensional chromatography mass spectrometry. So this is the uh, aerobic span samples. And so this was the volatile profile on day zero. Uh, and the right hand side is day 30 of the aerobic. So you can see significant changes. And weirdly, you see um, on day zero, um, 
uh, a high abundance of that initial profile. And then you still see a uniformity on day 30, but less of so. So potentially something to do with the microbial activity and interaction and why you don't see much of um, the, the VOCs. But interesting, you do see an abundance on the aerobic because you have seen that perforation of the abdomen tissue going through. We do use sorbent tubes, so we discussed that recently, um, and we've discussed about the GCTC, so I'll quickly go into that. Traditionally, you have um, in a GC system, you have one column. So you have um, essentially your inlet and you have the one column here. However, down to um, peak overload and peak capacity um, on the volatiles that we see, we saw a lot of collusion um, of peaks. And therefore, when you're talking about a GC GC instrument, what you're having is you're having one column, then having a module later which then um strings onto pulsates the um, analytes onto the second column which is a lot shorter which then goes to your yeah happy to answer any more questions around that at the end i don't want to go into more detail just specifically just very basic principles this is the um multivariate analysis from the data so you can see that, yes, there are variations between the two, um, but there are also similarities in terms of compound here. And this is the problem with using multivariate analysis is that, yes, it does show you a difference, but it doesn't show you the uniformity. It doesn't show you the similar compounds between the two. And this is here, you can see that actually, these are um, two specific, three specific compounds, that, um, dimethyl disulfide, dimethyl trisulfide, and dimethyl tetrasulfide, and you can see the variations and the presence of those compounds. Potentially, we can utilize that for time since death, depending on the environment in which the body is found. We're also investigating um, better uh, materials for body bags. We operationally, we have a big problem with um, liquids and entomological evidence um, either well, leaking in terms of fluids or uh, entomology dying. I won't go too much into this, but there are human taphonomy facilities across the globe um, to kind of allow um, uh, in eight, specifically in the US, one in Australia and one in mainland Europe, which is um, the Netherlands. And we utilize these for this research. Arista is the Netherlands facility and it's mainly sand, so coastal, uh, and we're utilizing some of the research that we've talked about previously. And this is the facility here, so it's its own ecosystem, very interesting, and we've seen um, a very degree of results, which we're going to now. And the results are conducted by the United Kingdom Netherlands Decomposition Experimental Research, which is the Tiffany Working Group. And this is where we have a multitude of universities in the UK, Portsmouth, UCLan, Northumbria, Staffordshire, Sligo, Coventry, to name a few, um, who are all have specialist interest in this area of expertise um, that are providing um, better understanding of what's actually happening during the process. A little bit about the results. Um, to my demise, uh, we took 320 samples above the body um, of sorbent tubes in a 12 month period, and we had no VOC variation above the body. We had cadaver dog detection, um, which did not indicate the area where the specimen was buried. Um, no entomological evidence was absent, so nothing of particular interest in terms of human decomposition. Pathology, so we did do post-mortem 12 months because of the results that we're getting was quite abnormal. Um, and what we found, as you can see from the picture on the right, was that there's this casing above the body, which we think has preserved the actual decomposition. And so we're actually in the middle of taking and analyzing these soil samples to look at the interaction across the bodies. And we've also conducting CT scans to establish where we are in terms of you know, non-invasive um, sampling of cadaver remains. And I think that was discussed in the previous talk around how you're utilizing that, but looking at the variations and 
we don't have um, a kind of standard DT about what does a body look like at 12 months decomposition? What does a body look like at uh, 24? And that's kind of um, the aspect that we're taking um, throughout. Operational, so how does this support operational staffing? We utilize it for search and recovery as discussed before, and it's making sure that we're using the right tools. Are they validated? Um, are they just not nonsense from textbooks that were written years ago? An example of this is the vegetation. So we have this um, picture here where we're looking at abnormality of vegetation growth. Um, and we're doing uh, a lot of biochemistry and interaction. We'll go on to that next. Um, and uh, utilizing multispectral imaging to see what variations in the vegetation are giving. Um, but if I go on to the next slide, can anyone suggest which of these pictures, and they are different, it's just very similar across the site, which of the pictures has a body underneath? Anyone would like to have the guess in the chat? A or B. See if we get any answers. Okay, I'll just tell you just to give you um just for the sake of time. Um it's actually A. So this one right here, if it allows me to write. So this one here, where there is actually no vegetation growth. Um, in comparison to the control areas here. So when we're talking about utilization um, and um, identification of vegetation growth of growth graves, it's not really a valid aspect um, to consider, but still having that in mind because it's an intelligence based um, approach. This is a project we're looking at uh, large sample numbers uh, and botanical aspects. So control one, control two, control three, are all just soil and plants. And specimen one is um, where we put small segments of tissue. And you can see just by the discoloration variations that there is a, a quite a significant difference in the color that you see. This is utilizing a DSLR camera using the same settings. Everything was standardized across and you can see that there is variations um, across. Scene recording. So making sure that we're using the facilities, again, for operational uh, and looking at maybe photogrammetry um, techniques, they're quicker um, and allow us to create 3D models, which you will now see here. So this is from the Arista facility, and this is you um, working alongside um, a company called River to create a virtual reality um, products. Uh, and this was created from me taking 30 DSLR cameras um, images, apologies, um, and took probably about two hours to model. So from that perspective, to be able to produce that on the scene and give it to any practitioners that are maybe at a distance to give their um, expertise would be vital and would be a real good tool um, to utilise. Cadaver dogs, again, we need to make sure that we're implementing standards and making sure that we understand what they're um, being trained on, um, the environment in which the samples are kept in, you know, we have to realistically look at, okay, what effect does that have? Can we start to make artificial training aids, start to understand uniformity again, to understand what they're actually detecting on? And this picture here is of a, a um, of a case that I attended um, of a suicide and um, the scuba divers here in their search. we had been asked to conduct um, the cadaver dog search um, above the, the water. And if you have a look at the dog, anyone see anything different? And this is a picture that I use for training is always make sure you're aware of the cadaver dog because if you're not, you will find out seven days later, the body just under here and popped up a few days after we'd left. Um, and we didn't see these pictures until we'd left and um, kind of, um, it was a learning experience. And that's what I always kind of hit home to a lot of the practitioners that we need to make sure that you're always um, and try to be 
Um, more visual on what you're doing. And finally, we're just starting to look at impressions. So this left picture is of a um, uh, hand in the environment of the Arista site um, and extremely difficult to extract fingerprints even from some of our um, expertise, um, seeing the crime officers, um, but we're looking at well, the uh, University of Amsterdam are looking at um, more spectrographic uh, techniques to uh, identify fingerprints, as well as finger um, footwear impressions published where we can go. Um, but unfortunately, when you're dealing with something like this, after we remove the remains, I think it's safe to say it's quite difficult to see if we can actually establish um, any footwear impressions that are unique to one specific person. There are obviously a large degree of papers, and I think it needs to be applied to more of a realistic environment. The lastly, um, um, application of taphonomy, obviously, is post-mortem interval, um, and is using um, biochemical techniques. So you'll be familiar um, with um, your traditional techniques with supervital reactions, rigor mortis, liver mortis, and MEDA and Octonam, um, looking at different aspects. But traditionally, uh, we use forensic entomology, um, if not um, vitreous humor, which is here and around biochemical pathology. But again, what effect does decomposition have on this? Um, we focused um, a lot of the actual analysis of um, vitreous humor and concentrating, it's safe to say, a lot around potassium. Um, but what else is in that complex that can indicate to us? We've kind of restricted our analysis, and I know there's a few papers that have gone to other aspects, but um, what is, can we broaden our horizons? Can we start to um, look at a variety of techniques for a variety of samples to hopefully give a better solution for criminal justice um, organisations? And if anyone is interested, there are obviously a, a, a large degree of other techniques on PMI. So conclusions, and I might have gone over slightly, so uh, my sincere apologies. But forensic taphonomy is no longer a subject that is researched independently from each specialist field. Um, we ensure that the purpose of the research is applicable to the criminal justice. Otherwise, you're doing research for the sake of doing research. My opinion, um, we need to speak to our operational staff. We need to speak to our pathologists and our anthropologists and understand where is it more applicable? What can we do? What are the questions are we answering? The techniques are not validated in the forensic taphonomy arena, um, but they can form intelligence and we can't just um, avoid the utilisation and analysis uh, of soil samples or um, you know, tissue samples or anything like that we've talked about today just because it's not validated. We can use it, but just be aware of the limitations of that. And um, finally, there needs to be a great amalgamation of international collaboration between facilities to compare both uniformity and differences of decomposition across different locations. And I love this. Um, much to learn we still have, absolutely. We still need to understand the requirements of operational staff, which then hopefully still all of us who are on the call with expertise in their own uh, individual areas that contribute to the bigger picture of a jigsaw. Um, we are each a piece of that puzzle and we need to contribute to that and make sure that we're doing the best that we can. I'd like to thank all the students that helped with both in the UK and the Netherlands, the Under Working Group Committee, the University of Leicester, Amsterdam Medical Centre, the Netherlands Forensic Institute who helped excavate and help with some of the uh, independent theories, and the National Dutch Police. And I'd like to say thank you so much for the invitation again, and I will hand over to the organisers. Um, if anyone wishes to contact me, feel free, I'm more than happy to have a Teams call or Zoom, um, but thank you again, and I hope I provided you an insight into the subject of forensic taphonomy.